We are ready. We're going to start the first match. 3 plus 2 unrated. And you guys may have seen these positions before. But that's the point. I want to get a, a higher rated player's perspective on similar positions. So let's do it. All right. Okay, so you guys might recognize this, but Italian game. I started with the move knight to f6. And we see d3 from white. Very valid move. Um, slower approach than d4. I'm thinking, you know, we can just go with classic d6, h6, castle, all this good stuff. Um, there's no knight coming into d5, so I'm not as scared of this bishop getting here. When I see move like d3, I'm just going to go with d6. Okay, we got uh, castling here. There's still a possibility of d4 happening. So always got to uh, always got to be on the lookout for that. And because of that, I think I'm going to take the opportunity to drop my bishop back to b6. Okay, it won't surprise you guys to uh, see me ask this bishop what it wants to do. So I just want to find out what diagonal or whether he's going to take. So h6 for sure. Okay, keeps the pin. This is a, a great move. Castling seems reasonable, but because I haven't castled, another way that I could try to play is with g5. Very aggressive. g5, force the bishop back, and then maybe bishop e6, and continue from there. So I can start with bishop e6, trying to get the double pawns here. I could just go for castling straight away, or we could go for g5, which is, I guess, quite aggressive, or definitely a more aggressive way to play. Uh, but we can still go for g5 even after bishop e6. So I'm going to start with bishop e6 and see how he plays. Okay, knight d2. Knight d2 makes a lot of sense. He wants to take back here. g5 for sure still looks like a uh, very reasonable idea. And castling as well. All these moves look uh, pretty standard, but when I see the, the setup my opponent's going for, it looks kind of non-threatening, it looks very slow, I don't see any d4 coming, so I am going to go a little bit aggressive with g5. Okay, bishop goes back. Time to develop this queen. Uh, I'm going to choose to go to e7, defends my bishop, maybe makes way for long castling, but we'll have to see. e3, no. Maybe he wants to move the knight. I'm really trying to understand. B3 catches me by surprise. Because I don't think I'm going to take to make his life that easy. Um, if I'm not going to take, then, then I am kind of questioning this move. I am questioning it. Um, for now, I think we continue with uh, rook g8. Trying to play h5. I just don't want to lose this pawn. Um, the other way to go, though, is just h5 straight away. And after h4, g4, knight g5. Not sure I'm a big fan. Gonna start with rook g8. Okay, he did decide to take. Um, I think I'm gonna take this with the pawn. Knight here, ready to take my bishop. Don't have much that I can do about that. Um, so I'm gonna probably shuffle my queen over to f7, maybe get knight h5. Okay, I think I'm going to continue with that plan of knight h5. Um, castling as well as what I want to do. So actually, let's castle first and then go knight h5. I don't believe in his attack. All right, it's an attack on both sides. Maybe what makes more sense uh, now is to just force the g file open. Okay, we've done that. We want to double up here. We want the knight to go to h5. That looks tough to stop. Here comes the, the knight to h5 move. Um, it's attacking my knight here. Let's reroute. Probably getting this knight to f4 should be pretty good. So we're going to take this. Bring the king up. You always have this idea, let's say. We're really just trying to bring like everybody into the attack. Pretty greedy of me. Got to be careful we don't uh, allow 
something like that to happen. I like the move. I'm going to go kind of aggro here and just literally ignore him and put a knight here. Got to take back. So, <laughs> hey, I'm not masking my intentions, right? Got to watch out for knight e5. There it is. Now, man, I'm just screaming for this move to happen. If I can get a capture here, I'm ready to send it. Tell this guy to stop making threats. I'm going all in here, folks. Nice move. Let's uh, go all the way back here. We're just eyeballing that. Just eyeballing it. Giving it a look there. Let's see what happens when we full send it. Let's take that guy in the middle. See what we can do here. Love the way he's playing. This one was a little much though. I think he was concerned about some, some moves here. But he went a little defensive there when I don't think he had to. I don't think he needed to. This move is always an idea. It's getting tricky now. Getting tricky. Let's throw in a check at least. Take this guy with a check. Now I feel like he's all tied up here. Like none of these pieces can move all of a sudden. And we got some checks now. And remember, if I can trade queens, it's basically game over. Um, let's. Just give a few checks here, checks here. We're gonna run our king to hopefully safety over here. Doesn't have any more checks. Okay, remember if we get to go here, that is going to be game over um, if we get to go here and trade the queens. But we will take this with a check. And that is going to be queen trade. And certainly enough. Tough first game. Tough first game. I decided, you know what? We're going to go h6. We're going to go uh, g5. And we're going to full send over there. Now, the problem with the full send is you're going to get attacked in return. I think he did a great job counterattacking. In fact, looked like he was the one attacking and I was the one counterattacking. Let's get a rematch and see how he handles it from the other side before we chat too much about it. All right, so my opponent's gone for d6. Um, I opted for knight f6, he went d3. He's doing d6, I'm going to play d4. I think I would do this regardless of what he played, though. Okay, so after takes, it's very clear. we got to take back with the pawn. We want two pawns in the center, and his bishop's going to have to move as well. Check. I think I want to avoid you know, giving him an option to trade those pieces, so... I'm just going to go knight c3. It's a great square for my knight, and we want to get castle. Well, no choice here. Okay, knight e7. Already, I'm looking at, you know, the tender squares in the position. So I'm looking at f7 here as, as a square that might, in fact, just be very weak. 
Um, knight g5 already stands out to me because he's not going knight f6 in castling. He's going knight e7, which means knight g5. I'm looking at this. Castles queen h5. We already might be uh, simply getting a very, very lethal attack going. So I think knight g5 is the move I'm going to go with. But if he played a different move, I was going to castle. Just like maybe put this bishop back here and slowly train everything towards the king side with a big center. But when I see this move, I just can't resist going for it. So my opponent's gone for d5. I'm the first thing I look at is takes takes knight takes f7 with takes and queen h5. He takes f7, you know there's queen e7 to consider. There's a there's a whole bunch of things. Um but I do have queen e2. I do have queen e2 there. So I think that move is probably uh probably good for me. Um takes takes here, queen h5, king e6, king smack in the middle of the board. That's a position you don't calculate. You castle, you just bring the rook in. So I think we take and go for this knight f7 thing. Well, I'm not going to bother explaining it again. Here it is. King takes f7. Hope it works. So he played what I would definitely consider to be one of the best moves, maybe the best move. Um, it's a nice in-between move. If I move the king, then there's like queen takes f7. I'm not really getting anything. But queen e2, the reason I liked it is it stops queen takes f7. So I'm going to just uh, continue here. The rook's under attack, which is nice to remember. So I'm going to take this. I have to take with the king. I take with the bishop. He just picks this up. So I got to take with my king. Yes, it allows knight takes c3 with check. But I can move my king to a square where it attacks the knight. And don't forget that rook's still under attack. So I think, I think he kind of had to do that. Maybe there were some other tricky moves. I'm not sure. Obviously, now we want to take this knight for free. Okay, king is jumping all over the place. Uh, two great bishop checks that I'm going to want to play. Um, which one is better? It's going to be hard to tell, but I'm going to go with this one. Um, force the king in the middle of the board rather than away. Okay, he's attacking my bishop. Got to save this one. Let's go back here. So we stop the bishop check. And let's bring a rook to the E file ASAP. I'm going to shovel our king over. Okay, take that back. Take the E file. This move looks very tempting with d5, but king f5 gets a little dicey. So, start with this, check. Now, I was going to play this move anyway, so it's not his fault if that he chose that square. This move was going to be winning no matter what. Let's try to take the knight and then take this. Check. We'll always have a checkmate threat here, which is kind of nice. It's like a permanent thing. So I'm actually going to make a point to go here. I'm even going to give up this pawn. I'm going to my king to one side and this mate threat is going to be there the rest of the game and he blunders it right there but my point was that if he brought the rook back to guard that his rook would be stuck there the rest of the game literally the whole the whole game so we would be uh, able to put him in a tough tough spot hey buddy hello i'm on first impressions how how was the oh. position which side did you prefer to play it from I feel like, in terms of how I did, I definitely think I preferred White's position. Did you expect that, like, going into it? Or is that just based on, like, how the games went? Kind of based on how the games went. Like, I feel it's kind of good they actually brought me on for this series because the main trouble I'm having at my rating at the moment is actually, when you get into the middle game, is actually yeah, building a plan and trying to figure out what right. to do with everything. So <laughs> Yeah, fair. Yeah. And it doesn't get, it doesn't really change. Like that's, that's a struggle at all ratings, but understandable. Yep. 
Yeah, okay. So I just shared my screen here in the call so it can be a little easier for you to follow um, along the board so you don't have to keep flipping the stream open. But um, we had, obviously this is the position here, it's black to move. Um, we can start with this. Uh, I guess we may as well start with, uh, with the game that you were white. Yep. Uh, did you want the analysis board open on my end as well, or just looking at No, your... if you're looking at the screen, then that's good. Yep. Yeah, and Discord, that's fine. Um, so, you went for D3, which is like a very... Oh, I think I have to do something here to make sure I can draw some pretty arrows. <laughs> Can't live without the arrows. Mmm, they're essential. All right. So just switch to my POV, but uh, there we go. Um, yep. You so chose to go with D3. Um, is this first of all? Do you play E4, E5? Let's say from normally, side? yeah. Yep. From both sides? Yes. Okay. So then, oh, there we go. So this is kind of perfect. Um, so is this a usual thing you do? Like, are you ever in these C3 positions? Because I guess it would be more normal to consider the move D4. Did you think of it at all, or it's just more your style to go like kind of chill, solid? And then push later. Um, no, I didn't really actually consider D four here. I just like D three. I guess kind of putting a bit more of a, a grip on E four, letting the dark square bishop that access to that diagonal, and then was planning on yeah, either developing that or castling next after uh, mm -hmm. after D three. Yep. Um, and uh, you were getting like I. I wasn't really able to keep up fully, but you were getting a lot of uh, comments mainly about your your thought process. It's a, you know a very clear, clear, concise way of thinking. So that's that's a nice that was nice to read. People shy. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I love it. Yeah. So you pretty much went with exactly what you just said. You obviously won castle. You wanted to open up this bishop, and you wanted to move it probably before you brought the knight out, so you didn't block it in. Knight comes out defending the bishop. I think my first question is going to be about this move, b3, and, and basically what your what your plan with this was, or why why you came up with this move. Because I didn't think it was very normal. Yeah, it was sort of like a, uh, kind of like a habits, a random pawn move, I reckon. It was in, yeah, I was kind of debating a couple of moves here. Um, I was kind of thinking about uh, rook e1, but I was concerned that, at some point, maybe down the line, you could have traded the like you could have gone for something that could have involved that a uh, dark square bishop and lining up on the f2 square if yep. I had it there. Yep. So I was a little bit sort of uh, wanted sort to of, keep it there. Yeah, f for the meantime, yeah. Right. And then I don't think you have yeah. the wrong idea with the random pawn move. It's just that your pawn move was so random. Like if you had chosen either one of these pawns and just gone the most aggressive route, I think it would have been. Um, a nice addition like this is always a nice move to play so you're kind of like gaining as much space as possible putting pressure you know, obviously you're threatening to trap the bishop in a couple moves um, yep so this is always nice uh, to threaten that and also just give your pieces a little bit more room and then b4 is nice because it controls you know some of the squares that my pieces might want to use and of course you're going to follow it up with this as well so b4 and a4 I yeah, think make okay. a lot of sense but b3 just has that that feeling like it kind of takes a square from your queen that like blocks your queen as well um it blocks basically all your, three of your pieces maybe from using it and it's not like i'm really going to take and maybe help you out like b takes uh c4 yeah so. okay so this was yep. really the only move that i felt seriously didn't belong because uh, uh the game itself you know just just made a lot of sense from your perspective so there's not many other moves to really harp on like you know obviously the knight comes out take the bishop of course i'm sure that was bothering you like it's not a nice piece yeah. to have staring at your king yep um you see this decided to go straight for the long castle Pr couldn't really decide between like initially going for that or castling but i figured as soon as i did this it's like you know the red light goes off it's time to time to go forward Here we yeah go. a4 so i like this but just for example if that pawn was already on b4 that's an important move you already saved yeah yep so it's basically kind of a race here. Um, I should be well ahead, and I I think right here, Queen E1. Were you like just trying to reinforce this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, because this also guards like maybe the pawn. I wasn't sure if you were thinking about trying to work some d4 in, but I felt like this was more reinforcement type move. Yeah, that's that was my idea with it, yeah. Okay, and then I think this moment was kind of important because if black goes knight a5, there's not really an attack, and you know, I think black just kind of crashes through. Yeah, if I was just like, you know, everything feels blocked and I'm obviously a couple moves away from maybe even tripling up here and you can't move the poor guy because what's behind him and it just yeah. feels like it just feels like this would have made things a little bit uh, easier for me. Yeah, because I love your counterplay that you came up with after this. I mean, obviously, a five is not the craziest move to spot, but, you know, you're threatening to maybe trade one of my rooks, which is annoying. So I go here and then this is a great well-timed move because you just need to open things up. I mean, when this king is sitting there, the same way that I was trying to open things up when I saw your king sitting there in the next game, you have the, you have yep. the right instinct for this. Yep, okay. So knight g6. I mean, I'm trying here, and at this point, you know, when I'm in full send mode here, this is one of those times where you can tell yourself, like, you kind of get that feeling that, yeah, you know, whatever he's doing is probably not supposed to work. It's still scary. But there's probably an accurate sequence somewhere in the position for you that, that yep. shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be good for me to go like king here, king here, and like let you just like walk all over my pawns like that. Okay. So definitely like, you know, obviously I haven't checked with the engine or anything, but just the way that I know how chess works, you should have something. There's, just, there's no way you shouldn't. Um, I'm yep. not quite in time with like these sacrifices or anything. Queen here, great move. I mean, you've got, obviously got a nice threat there. Rook here, yep. another great move. These are like just getting harder and harder to stop. And right when it was like the tipping point, right here, if you make like one or two more threats, I'm almost running out of pieces to defend with. So I thought that this was the moment where you could have sort of sealed it. So maybe looking back on this position, now that you're here again, maybe a better move yep. than bishop takes f4. What do you think? What, what else could you try here? Because I, I think you just need to pile just slightly more pressure on, and my position is yeah. kind of crumbling. Um, maybe, uh, could we maybe play rook to d1 here? Yep. And just, I mean, you tell me, how am I defending that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yep. better, okay. I mean, better, better start with a, another question. Am I defending that? Yep. Um, but yeah, rook d1 is just one of those moves that you're using. The only piece you haven't used yet. You're putting it on open file, so even like from a habits perspective, it's just a very natural move as well. Yeah. But just yep. from a, a an overall chess perspective, it's like that perfect feeling of, hey, let me get that last piece into the attack, make a you know pretty much a game winning threat, and your rook that you wanted to leave there because of maybe the bishop. Now that bishop's not yep. there, so you kind of don't have any any reason for it to still be chilling. Yeah. Yep. So rook d1 was certainly the move that I was like, okay. That's going to happen. I don't have much choice. Like, I might have to play some crazy move like d5. Like, you've got knight e5 coming in. And no matter what here, and you're making one, two, and then three threats, and I have to take one, two, maybe three pieces away from my attack. As soon as I start playing defense, I'm kind of dead meat because I, I went full attack mode on you. So if I have to okay. start pulling my guys back into defense, plus I can't even do it, but, you know, let's say I could, like, bring one, two, three pieces back to defend. I would just be toast here because my king's you know running around here and yeah just i don't have any any threats without my pieces attacking once they start defending it's over yeah okay so this this was a um killer move let's say and bishop takes here i think you can still do this i know it's kind of crazy to lose the spawn but sidestep your king and i just i just don't see like a super easy defense to this yep but understandably, like I knew if you didn't play it initially, that you probably had something else on your mind. And it's not yeah. like the moves you played were bad. But the reason why I went for this was because I saw the possibility for this, and I was like, okay, I feel like if I give him any more time, he's just gonna organize his knight and you know put the rook over there, and I don't really have an answer. So that's the main reason I sacked here, even though you can defend, and you did defend with knight g2. Yep. Um, and here I think things got slightly out of hand. This is nice for me that I'm able to defend this pawn while still like making a lot of threats. So the queen yeah, okay. for me is super, super nice. And then just defending that pawn, it looks like nothing. But being able to move my rook from the defensive position to the aggressive g8 position flips the game for me entirely. Like at least I have some 
serious, tricky ideas. And as soon as you start switching from attack to defense, you can see how the whole game kind of turns around, right? And then it's just like, yeah, it's like really unfortunate. You've got this extra knight, but the four guys sitting there stuck. You've got three beautiful pieces all playing defense. And, you know, some moves ago, if you had brought the rook to the offensive position, it's more like I would have been the one in the position that you're in right now. All my beautiful attacking pieces would have had to come back and play defense. Yep. Okay. So that was the flip there. And, you know, as soon as things get down to the wire, obviously I'm going to have that sort of innate edge of being able to maybe turn a bad position into a decent one in a time scramble. So um, there's always that element, but also your position just gets tougher and tougher to play as you're put on defense. Yep. And yeah, obviously here we have this nasty position where, yeah, everything feels like it's stuck. Yeah. It's just like nothing to do. So it was like a, a great early game. And then, uh, as I mentioned, I should have just kind of plugged your attack. But you did a great job making me pay for it. And what ended up happening was uh, sort of that typical you know, activate the final piece. That's that's all you needed to do. And the Rook on F1 wasn't participating in the attack. If you brought him in, I think it was a position you could finish off. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah, after this, I mean, two extra pawns and just all the checks and everything, it's it's a, kind of a hopeless task. Yeah, um, definitely. And then the second one, to chat about this. So obviously that one went really well. Um, this one got definitely dicey early on, like they're very kind of spicy. And I, I wasn't a big fan of like giving up this bishop early. So you went for d6 and this is actually the, um, did you think about any other move here or were you kind of set on d6 from the start? I kind of thought about your move, but I didn't know, I kind of wanted, I guess, to offer something different. I didn't think that d6 was a bad move mm -hmm. to be something different to a knight f6. That's why I went for that. No, obviously opening up the light squared bishop. Whilst yep. doing it, yeah. Yep. So, I mean, you're defending the center. So after this move, you pretty much have to take... Um, I think I played... I'm trying to remember, but I think it was Neil um, that I played this against. And it was the exact same position. He went here as well. I went here. He went bishop back. And as a result, I'm basically able to sort of win some pawn here. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you do have to play the way that you did. If you're going to play d6, you have to take. And taking is not... You know, it's just not it's not the greatest when you only have d6. You know, I have two central pawns. I'm obviously very happy with the center. You give me a check, yep. and then you basically give away the bishop right away. So now I've got two center pawns, even supported with another pawn, plus the bishop pair. So already, I think that white's just jumped out to an early lead. Yep. Okay. So um, definitely, uh, I mean, you said you're an e45 player. I don't know if you ever find yourself in this type of position. Maybe you play different lines, so... You don't necessarily end up here, but certainly knight f6, I would, I would say is uh, yeah, pretty much the bar none move here that, that you play. Definitely not d6, but mostly because of what we saw in the game. Okay, well, this is from the uh, Juco Piano, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, normally I just play the Jerome, so I don't normally get into these uh, positions. <laughs> what about as black? <laughs> um, well, as black, I give them the opportunity, and then they normally play something like c3, and then... So sort of actually getting into this sort of position, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes I've played d6, other times I've played knight f6. Right. So I would eliminate all the times you've played d6. Um, I, I, yeah, would, okay. I would give knight f6 a look. Um, there's definitely some stuff to check with, uh, with this move, but obviously having a knight here hitting the center makes your idea of like a bishop check work way better than just d6. Okay. Like yep. the, the knight out instead of the pawn. So similar ideas, but I would check it out because d6, I think if if you're getting into this position on a regular basis as black, you're going to be in serious trouble. What White is just super happy to be be here, have a great position, and you know if you're giving away your bishop this early, it's tough. Because I know you don't really want to play here. Maybe like a bishop pin is looking scary or a quick pawn push in the center. Um, yep. Any of the above. But knight e7, which is what you played, I think gets you also into serious trouble because probably of the move that I went for in the game. Yes, yeah. I was very concerned about either the bishop or the knight hopping into a g5. Right, because castling, I think you maybe noticed that just, yep. yeah, like immediately KOs you here. And so you, you played what I thought was the move you were going to go for, and I thought it was going to get pretty spicy, a lot of calculations, but um, at least the way I saw it, the 
the calculations should always work out for white. And it makes sense. I've got the center. I've got your bishop for, for nothing, essentially. So all the, yep. the boxes are kind of being ticked for my position. Takes, knight takes. And definitely, I think, like, there's a few moves. Queen f3 also came to mind. Um, but I mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't sure, like, bishop e6. It's not great, but, hey, it kind of does hold things together briefly. Whereas I thought knight takes f7 was a more direct approach. But either way... Just like I said last time, you get this into this position on a regular basis, you're just you're just gonna lose a lot, a lot of games. Yeah. Okay. Right. This is this is a position you want to learn from and then like basically never be in again. So I'm not really yeah. giving you a lot of advice here on like, hey, you should have done this instead of that, because you shouldn't even just be in this position at all. Yeah. So I would take it back to the the very first move and really give knight f6 a good look at because um, d6 is just a little bit too passive for how urgently white's playing with c3, d4, and I'm kicking you around. And uh, yeah, yeah you, you are going to end up in like crazy tactical skirmishes like this, and they're often going to favor white just because the center and the bishops and everything. Okay, yep. Uh, I did expect this from you, though. Um, like, you, you never really, in both of our games, you never seem to play a line that was, like, obviously losing. So I, I credit you a lot for that, and I think the chat noticed that as well, like, you never really go down easy, right? You're always going to find a, a move, queen e7. You're not going king takes f7 and getting into all sorts of mess. Um, and even yep. here, king takes. At the end of the day, what did I do? I, w I won a pawn, right? <laughs> Just yep. one pawn. Um, it still should be enough to, for a serious advantage for white. But again, it's not like you're down a piece or you know resignable or anything like that. OK. Um, so I decided to go back here. I guess the one really like aggressive plan that you should consider here is knight a5 because your king can sit back on d7 in case you get checked and at least this does come with you know an idea of getting your knight involved a check a nice outpost yeah okay so that's probably the the only idea otherwise yeah if you're just sort of trading down my bishops plus my extra pawn and giving me the open file like yeah you're just kind of asking for trouble yep and this move i think loses i know you're probably yeah not i missed the I missed the tactic of kicking the knight away to then fork the uh, two pieces there. Yep, and even if you didn't play this, right, it's like this move, same thing. Yep. Same thing. So kicking the king away, as you said, king goes back, d5. So it doesn't matter you walked into the pin, this move was going to be a killer. And yeah, at this point, grabbing the extra piece means that the rest of the game is uh, not going to be too complicated. Yeah, okay. So that was more about the opening. I think that... I think this d6 move is just a little bit soft. Knight f6, and I'll leave you to maybe check it on your own, but this this move works a lot better with knight f6, and the idea being, like, you know, you might go for a d5 now, and hey, look at the difference. Like, there's no bishop supporting a knight there. Hey, there's no knight there. <laughs> there's no extra yep. pawn here and here, you know what I mean? Like, position is very similar to what you got, but just way better on, like, two two to three different accounts. Okay, yep. So um that was that one um love the games they were very competitive even the first one you had all the chances uh i got another position for you i don't think it'll be too unfamiliar in terms of like if you've seen the habit series maybe you've seen this show you will definitely recognize it but it might not be one that you play for one color or maybe even both colors i'm not sure okay so we'll see but it, it's just from the opening so you have a lot of creative freedom all righty sounds good all right i'll leave you to it All right, bishop g4 in the Karo Khan. I think we stick with our tried and tested. You know, you always play h3, ask this bishop what it's doing. Okay, and he's letting me know that he's bringing that bishop back to h5. He wants to keep the pin. Makes total sense. I think I'm going to go for d4, take the center, and see what's next. Okay, e6. I mean, hey, it makes a lot, a lot of sense. Strengthening the uh, the center here. e6 is a really, really key move to do ASAP after you get the bishop out. I'm considering a few different moves here, like bishop e2, obviously, to break the pin. But bishop d3, a little bit more aggressive, can definitely also be tried. And I think I'm uh, 
a little more interested in bishop d3, queen e2, stuff like that. Um, so I think I'm going to go for that, a bit more aggressive. Yeah, we got this pin here. I'm not worried about losing this pawn or anything at the moment. That's why I got my bishop here. So I think I am uh, definitely, well, mainly considering castling just to get out of this. Seems to make a lot of sense. The other thing to do would be something a little more crazy like g4. But I'm going to keep it to castling and uh, getting out of the pin. Maybe seven. Um, the last time we played, I feel like he kind of got in trouble with a knight here instead of here. And once again, I feel like this move is a little bit soft instead of knight f6. Doesn't control a lot of squares. Doesn't have a lot of squares to go to. So I am kind of happy to see that um, as well. So I think a3 is like a nice move to just challenge this bishop. Once again, find out where he's at. Should pay five, so he doesn't want to take it. Understandable. Why don't we? I mean, even getting the uh, the bishop out here makes some sense as well. Pin the knight, keep developing. Castling. Okay, time for rookie one. Classic habits move. Got to bring the rook to the middle. F6, bring the bishop back. We want to end up on this diagonal. Okay, there could be some idea here with bishop takes d4, although, you know, it definitely gets very dicey, moves like g4 and pawn takes. I am curious how he's going to complete his, uh, his development, though. I am wondering. We need two. Also pawn takes. I think we can try pawn takes, open up our bishop, see how he wants to take back. Okay, I'm going to go me two and uh, just make a threat against this knight here. Right there. So my bishop's under attack. Definitely, you know, you think of him as like g4 here, but I think bishop to, to g3 sort of makes the uh, makes the most sense here. So we'll go with that one. Okay, he takes on uh, takes on f3. So he's greedy. He wants this pawn, but I'm not sure that. Uh, but that's the right decision. So we'll see. Queen h5, certainly uh, the move that I'm probably considering. Put some nice pressure here. Okay, and let's bring the rook over. I don't really want to just cash in this extra pawn for nothing. Got some moves to be careful of here. Specifically, this one was available. Um, gonna take it. Let's take back. And again, I'm not sure that I really want to just go taking that, so I'm gonna keep the bishop on the board. I want to add the pressure to the position. Well, that one is. Uh, <laughs> Not going to go unpunished. Not going to go unpunished. He'll be kicking himself for that one. Let's uh, go for a trade. Now let's simplify. Because now we just want to trade pieces. <laughs> it's not... 
not even the best move to do that, so <laughs> I'm not even going to take it. But... I just had to hover it, just to you know, let you guys know. Let's just let you guys know. But when it rains, it pours. And you're blundering like that. Two bishops, though, against the two knights in his position. Um, very, very tough to handle. So let's flip it over. I think he was doing uh, pretty decently there. But when he gave up that bishop to win the pawn, perhaps I was a little greedy. Let's get the rematch in. All right, familiar position. Now we have the black pieces. Um, bishop g4 was what um, uh, the Iceberger went. So I'm actually going to play it as well. I like the move. We want to play e6 next. So let's go for it and see how he handles it. Okay, bishop e2. Of course, makes a lot of sense. Um, knight f6 here, and then if e5, we can go knight d7. The bishop still covers the e6 square. So one thing to be careful of that I've mentioned before, in this series even, is don't let e5, e6 happen where you have to maybe double your pawns. I'm going to go knight f6, and we'll see what he does. He does push forward. I think we're going to go knight d7, and again, my plan after h3 this whole time has definitely been to capture. So if I go back, I'm not a big fan of allowing this e6 move. So we're going to go here. As at the moment, we do have e6 covered. e4. Okay, we're going to get e6 in. Really, really crucial move in the Cairo Khan. We want to do this ASAP. Okay. We are going to... Um, well, we actually have a nice option now of taking... Um, the knight, or simply going back, but taking makes a lot of sense to maybe continue with the move c5 and really undermine the center with the knight on c3. There's no pawn there, so it's not like he can be taking back and strengthening it. So I'm going to go for that plan. Okay, so bishop e3. Taking is definitely, uh, Definitely the first thing that I'm considering because no matter how he takes back, I follow up with knight c6 and I think I'm making a threat that can't be dealt with uh, on e5. So if I go here, I feel like maybe there's like a chance to take or something. I'm not sure. I think I win a pawn here in most cases, but I think the cleanest is to start by taking, followed by knight c6. Okay, so um, we're going to take this pawn. It's, it's free. Should be ours to take. Um, just wondering maybe if there's a world where we want to start like this. But I think it's fair to, uh, to just grab that um, with this knight on b7. So let's just have a seat. Take, take, take. Um, the first thing you do is you check, like, bishop takes b5. Takes, takes, rook. E1. It's the first thing that I'm going to check. Um, F6, for example. F4. You know, there's uh, there's moves all over the place there. Um, for those reasons, I'm thinking maybe knight takes d4 might be a little bit better. A little bit safer, maybe, because this pawn is always going to be weak. So I think I probably am going to go for that. And hey, if you don't mind uh, getting developed with tempo. Yeah, one thing you want to be super careful of in the Cairo that you'll only learn from experience is you don't want to be too greedy before your castle. Things can really backfire.
Okay, it's not really any threats or anything. I'm gonna go uh, probably harass this pawn here. Okay, let's get the move a6 in. A6 actually sets up this move. Okay, so he plays a uh, knight there. I'm going to jump all the way back. You want to kick his knight out. We're threatening a pawn. You want to go rook here as well. Start with b5. Kick the knight back. Now the rook comes to the open file. Gets out of the way of this, uh, this nasty bishop. And I think we can, uh, well, let's even make a threat here on that pawn. Very important. And I think we'll be able to grab this one for free here. Threatening the rook. And it's just that bishop is not able to defend things in the middle. That's what sucks. And we'll be able to get a checkmate in there. GG's the iceberger. That one, that game just wasn't his. I mean, at the end, you know, I even have d4. There's a whole bunch of reasons why, you know, this, this position's really good for black. But that was just a Karakhan that didn't go well. And hey, it might not even be in his repertoire. So um, it's tough playing a position if you haven't, uh, haven't really gotten it in your games before. Hey, buddy. Hello, Amon. How's it going? I, I, I'm not sure the extent of your Karakhan uh, knowledge, so I'm sure this one... Uh, it definitely felt like you were a little less comfortable than obviously E45, which you you, know, you say you play from both sides. So I mean, what is yes, your Karakhan uh, background? <laughs> quite limited, you know. Um, Fair. I feel like... Let me have a look at the start of this again. Um, I feel like normally... Yeah, this isn't the advanced variation, is it? Did you say this is or isn't? Were you, were you talking about... Isn't. When, uh, no, this isn't the advance. Yeah, because normally when I play it, I normally push uh, E5, I think, and go from there. Yep. So this position was definitely uh, unfamiliar. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely got that feeling. Uh, whereas E4, E5 was like, I, I think you, I felt like you were right in there. Yep. So I'm going to bring both of these up. I did share my screen again in... Discord. Yep. So I think it started with um, this one, me with the white pieces. So you went for bishop g4, and hey, you said you don't have much Karakhan experience, but right off the bat with your first like two or three moves, I think you did some important things that not everyone uh, might do as quickly. Maybe they'd be like loosely aware of the ideas, but they wouldn't do them as quickly. And what I'm referring to is the move e6. So obviously I'm asking what you're doing here. Going back, keep the bishop. Yep. E4 and then e6. So what I'm referring to is like sometimes you get in these positions where you go f6. And um, you know, a lot of the time the move e6 is super annoying for black in the Karakhan. Like you take and the pieces just get like pushed around. Um, yeah. Just feels like these positions can be so uncomfortable. Yep. Um, yeah, I noticed just from the opening position that obviously when you were playing white, you were ahead in development. So that's why I decided on that bishop move to try and catch up in that in that sense. Yep. Oh, you like bring the, the bishop. Out. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You want to get your bishop out, and you want to play e6 only after you've done that, so you don't block it in. But you need to play e6 really quickly. So usually it's one of the first you know two to three moves that you play after you you move that bishop. So I love yep. the quick e6. It's just like super solid in the center. It's all you're looking for. Um, but I feel like, you know, there's not many conclusions that I can fairly draw from two to four games, you know, that we've, that we've played today. But uh, one thing that I'm noticing quite frequently is, you know, you're like chucking this bishop out here and you're either willing to take my knight or even putting it there. If you're not planning to take my knight, probably shouldn't be there. Okay. Because my king's just going to castle, and then it's like, hey, you're, you're either here to like take this knight or not, type of thing. Yep. Um, because otherwise, you might be better suited on some of these other squares. Yep. Okay. 
Um, and certainly taking it, I don't think is any good because you got all light square pawns here. Your dark squares are going to be suffering. Yep. So you really want to keep that bishop. Um, I understand why you went there. I think that you probably didn't want it sitting on this square because you wanted your knight there and you didn't want it sitting on that square because of that. <laughs> yep. So fully understand there, but uh, I think you maybe need to realize that this move is not so scary. So you could adopt a similar idea that I had in my game, for example, if you did like knight f6, and maybe you're concerned about this, but I wouldn't be. Then you just drop your knight back, and as soon as someone pushes against you in the Karakhan, I release all the tension. Suddenly there's no like opening of the position, so you've just got this really closed lockdown center, and you can do exactly what I did when I was black. Follow up with this move, undermine yep. the center, this knight comes out, and suddenly it's like every piece is attacking the center. This bishop has a perfect square to go to. The knight goes there, the knight goes there, and it's like all your pieces have the have a de desirable square. Yep, okay. So knight f6 is a decent place to start. I don't have to push, but you know then you can consider taking as well, getting a few trades in. Obviously, trades are going to help you because you have a little bit less space. Yep. So yeah, don't be afraid of these like, you know, pawn push things that like hit your pieces because this totally changes the dynamic of the position it closes the center it's not necessarily something i want to do yeah okay um so instead of you grabbing your bishop and being like okay i'm gonna start with this where do i put it well then i understand you putting it here because if you put it here suddenly it's like okay if i move like pawn here <laughs> your knight just doesn't have anywhere to go really and if you go here you're like okay well after pawn there, why did I even bother? So if you start with the knight, then you can decide based on my reaction how you really want to put that bishop later. Okay. Yep. But knight f6, bishop e7 looks normal. So you went with this. You got the double pin going on. Definitely a lot of pressure. Um, I decided to yeah get this bishop out, open the e file. I'm I'm as you pointed out earlier. I'm kind of really far ahead in development right now. Queen there. I'm like almost done. Right. And you still got pieces to get out, plus I'm making a threat here. So you go knight g6, I go back, and then here you make a decision which I think you might regret. I don't know, did you feel like you regretted it after you did it, or um, you felt like this was kind of the, the way that you had to proceed in the position? Because I was wondering if you felt like grabbing that pawn was worth it. Yeah. Um, that was the idea, obviously. I kind of thought, you know, Patsa sees a pawn, Patsa takes a pawn. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely missed the idea of like how you were like you know, how afterwards you proceeded with Queen H five and you sort of with that bishop you're X raying the um H seven square. I haven't really got a good way to uh defend the knight, I feel like. Yeah. So you're probably gonna grab that pawn back anyway. Exactly. So I have the pawn that's like mine for the taking. But I also have yep. the way of playing, which is more like the game, where it's like, I don't even take the pawn, and I just use the pressure as my compensation. Yeah. Which is almost more unpleasant. So if you had a way to like bring your knight back to that square, save your knight, guard that, perfect. But obviously, because you're kind of lacking in development, you have other things to take care of. Yep. Um, and here, there, there is some knight takes d5 stuff, but you know, maybe it would get a bit messy. Decided to just bring the rook in. Um, you got rid of the bishop. There were obviously some, you know, a few threats there, especially with the loose bishop. So understand that. But it's tough, right? It's tough for you to even get your pieces in because I'm even ready to sacrifice in some cases. Yeah. With this x-ray, as you pointed out. Plus c4 is going to be a real nasty move next if I can play that. Just further opening up these two rooks. Two bishops, two rooks, open position. And if I want my pawn, it's there for me to take. Yeah, yeah. So tough, but you know I fully I fully understand your your position. But I think a couple games you've done this bishop before, followed by ninety seven. So it was the same in the Re, or not Re Lopez, but the Italian game. You did bishop yep. here, traded ninety seven, and you just notice like the knight f six. It really is a big difference. The squares you control, like me, my queen even being on this square, is because of ninety seven. Like I, I shouldn't really normally have access to that with a knight on f six covering everything. Yeah. So I just uh, I have noticed like bishop b4 knight e7 from you a few times as a way to develop all the pieces. But uh, if you can, you do generally want your knight on f6, and you do generally want your bishop to let's say not give itself up for the knight uh, early on in yep. these openings, whether it's Karakhan or whether it's the Italian. Okay. Yep. Bishop f5. So yeah, this is me saying, look, I just want to keep the pieces on the board. 
you know, I do have maybe a few threats here. I can cash this in any time, but because I can do it any time, no rush. Yeah. Um, and then obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Seven. I think the idea I wanted to get back there to try and add a defense, like maybe putting it on F7 and trying to hold on. But yeah, there's, there's no squares there and being under time pressure. I, th I think I was under time pressure at this point. I definitely missed the uh, yeah, uh, bishop 100%. covering that square. 100%. We were both low here, plus like the rook, the bishop, mm. and then the other bishop. Like your queen just doesn't have a lot of scope. And obviously, you don't really want to take a journey too far to this side of the board. So it is unpleasant. Yeah. 100%. That was just why I think that, you know, not that it was greedy to take this pawn, but that it was <laughs> almost just like a, a decision that you couldn't refuse. You had, to, you had to go for it. You sort of committed yourself to it. But I think that is always going to turn out well for white. Just this pressure with queen h5. Um, so if we flip to the second game, you'll, you'll probably see a few parallels as well. This is me with the black pieces. So I like your move. I, I copied it as well. Bishop g4. You went for bishop e2. And I decided to go for knight f6. And I did it immediately. I was explaining. Um, obviously, you couldn't hear me. But I was explaining that my bishop's covering e6. So I'm OK not having my pawn there. And then if yep. the move h3 comes, I don't want to go back because then this happens. Um, and it's okay. not like this is always good. Like sometimes this isn't a great move, but I, I, I just don't want to deal with this as black ever. I don't think anybody should just get that pawn e6, no trouble. Yeah. So I was going to take and then play, well, here I win a pawn, but basically my idea is like, give that bishop up and then play e6. Yeah. Okay. So this is the sort of idea which I was mentioning to you. Don't be afraid to, you know, force the issue with white center and then just go back. And just go back and yeah. say, all right, there's no problem. Like, I lose a tempo, quote unquote, but not really. Like, this knight wants to be here. It's pressuring the center and it closes things up. Closed position in the Cairo Khan is really, really good for, for black, usually. Okay. So, this is what happened. And pretty much what I mentioned to you as like a suggestion in, in the last game, I'm kind of going for in this game. Happy to give my bishop up because that knight is guarding those two center pawns. This bishop can't attack them, so I'm getting rid of your defender, and I'm getting rid of someone that was never going to be an attacker. So now the knight comes out, and it's just so much pressure. Like two two knights and you know a single pawn. It just kind of like undermines your whole the whole thing you got going there. Yeah. Yep. Imagine your knight was like here, and you could play the move c3. Boom, you're totally fine, right? Takes takes, and it's like pawn just defends one another and can keep capturing, capturing, capturing. But right now, you're about to have a piece takeover on d4, and suddenly the whole thing falls apart. Yep. So as white here, I know this is probably not an opening that um, you're really considering to play full-time or anything like that, but I think you want to be careful with a move like e5, d4, because those pawns, they don't have support from c3, and it just kind of closes the position up. So even taking is probably a better shout. d3 can even happen. I know there's a queen trade coming, but... Um, guards, guards the pawn, keeps it safe. Um, and then h3 is the other one you could consider, because then your bishop comes to the defense. Yep. Okay. I like h3 the most, because, hey, you're happy with this, right? Yep. Covering, covering that. And then if I go back, at least you can give some consideration to maybe making me pay for that. My bishop's not covering it, and, you know, I don't know what's happening here, but <laughs> it never looks comfortable to me. Yep. For black, that is, yeah. So this was our game. Takes, takes, knight there. I didn't grab this pawn. I, I don't know. Did you did you have any plans, like, if I was going to take that pawn? Or were you surprised that I didn't? Um, I mean, the only thing I was kind of thinking if you did take it was to maybe just put a rook on e1. And then I could maybe move the light squared bishop and try and be aggressive with something like f4. Mm -hmm. And then, like, something to try and open up the, uh, the lines so, like, a little bit. If, if you go right now... Obviously, you're just going to get in trouble because you got a whole bunch yep. of bishops hanging. So let's say you took. Um, if you go rookie one, I get to trade with you. And just like yeah. maybe bring the bishop out and sort of get safely castled. But yeah. um, what I was thinking was, that, you know, shout out to your aggressive options idea. I was a little concerned about this. And, yep. you know, boom, like this happens. And I just don't know if I'm hanging on here. Okay, yep. Because you're hitting this, uh, you got like f4 coming, you got this pawn hanging, you know, queen h5, hitting all sorts of things. So 
with the rook coming to d1 and you know is that you know, is that worth my skin basically trying to grab that yeah. pawn and i thought no okay decided to take and like here's an example where i don't think you have a terrible position at all but your bishop can't participate in defending this whereas mine can participate in attacking so we have this typical thing of like i'm just going to gang up on that pawn and mine on the in the meantime are totally solid all protected right yep so i didn't think it's not like you're seriously worse here but just one of those positions where especially in blitz so much easier to play as black yeah okay really solid so i think you just kind of didn't have a clear plan like neither you know, none of your pieces can really go anywhere like the rooks like, everything's just kind of blocked off you're not attacking you're sort of defending here don't have any clear pawn bayonets to like attack the center so i just felt like it was kind of a tough tough spot for you to be in and we see this threat and that's just so hard yeah. to defend king i mean at this point we're obviously we're low on time but this is kind of my point that it's a position that's really easy to get low on time in and uh you know it doesn't doesn't surprise me that you had a hard time playing it because it's, it's just not yep. comfortable okay and sure, we you know we do want to yeah. take this. Yeah, I mean, it's low yeah, on time. As soon as I have, yeah, I said I need to take that first before <laughs> recapturing the uh, right the knight. Yep, hundred percent. And here you're you're still struggling, but obviously losing both your center pawns. The the game has changed so much since the the opening, and you know I just have an easy way to double rooks on the c file and just put tons of pressure. Yep. So yeah, the. Uh, the second game was obviously kind of tough, but I think in some ways the second game, aka this one that we played, kind of showed you um, how you could have played or approached the first game because I think you were a little bit hesitant to play knight f6 in, in your game, and yep. that's why you wanted to get the bishop out in 87, but knight f6 in the Karakhan is really, really optimal, and you're sort of almost baiting, but sort of encouraging your opponent to play e5, and then you go back to d7, and then that's where your, your other pieces can jump into action pretty comfortably. Yeah, okay. So it's just nice to have these positions where you know, okay, this knight goes here, this bishop goes here, this knight goes here, this bishop's outside the pawn chain, you know, this queen can go c7, b6, and, like, everyone's happy, right? You got a square for everybody. Yep. Whereas if you kind of go into maybe some of this stuff, and like knight here, it's like, yeah, that the, everyone gets a square, but it's not really the square they want. It's like this bishop might end up here, and this guy here, and knight here, and it's it's never as optimal as if you can put pieces on their like natural squares, you know, attacking the center. Yep. Okay. So some small things. I know this is probably a little less useful because it's not really in your repertoire, whereas e45 is, and we definitely saw some stronger games out of you in e45, but um, I still think that. Comparing how you approach this position to you know a player a little bit lower rated than you, you can already see that you know you got out of the opening in a much more solid way, whereas you know a lower rated player is running into trouble in the Karo Khan in like you know less than five or less than ten moves. Whereas for you, you're getting into the middle game just fine and you're making a tactical decision to win a pawn, and then in the long term it turns out to maybe not be so good. But that's that's obviously a whole whole different level of thinking. Okay. So I, 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 I haven't heard, heard what you were saying, so I'm excited to check it out myself afterwards. But yep. I, uh, I was reading a little bit of the chat. I know people were pretty complimentary for uh, what you were saying out loud. And obviously, it's harder to play when you're you know, spending time speaking and making sure you're not talking complete BS. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's the one thing I was concerned about. Yeah. I think I mentioned it at some point. I hope <laughs> that what I'm saying is at least half reasonable succinct yeah to a degree yeah. so i i definitely uh, appreciate you uh taking the time and um hopefully at least the first couple games maybe were a bit more useful but people are really going to appreciate seeing a, a different elo like you know maybe see a 600 an 1100 and then a 1500 all play the same position and just like the, the differences in their thought process and how yep. it might uh, affect their play so definitely it's yep. going to be okay. a, a big help all right, I appreciate it, man, and and thanks for. I mean, you 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 uh, even took the damn day off work to uh, to make this happen. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate that. No, that's all right. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, cheers. That was the iceberger, guys. Give him give him some love. I uh, 
I hope his soothing uh, Aussie accent was pleasurable to listen to um, as, uh, as he was delivering some higher quality chess than we're used to seeing on this show, at least so far. So, cheers, buddy. <laughs> Too easy. Thanks, man. All right. Bye for now. Skinner.